John Allen, President of Brookings, welcome to HFX. It's always a pleasure to see you. I remember that we, um, I think we first met um, just after you'd stepped down as President Obama's uh, envoy to, for, to, to, to lead the global co coalition against ISIS. And obviously prior to that, uh, <coughs> you'd led the, um, the NATO International Security Assistance Force, uh, uh, known as ISAF. <clears throat> so you've actually worked um, at the sharp end of these big international institutions, uh, and, and very few are bigger in terms of the democratic world's institutions than NATO. Um, I wonder, where do we go from here? I mean, no institution is perfect. Um, where do we go, go from here at the, most bro at the broadest possible level in terms of global democratic institutions? What, what else is there to build, and what amongst the things that we already have, do we need to breathe new life into and reimagine for the 21st century? Uh, well, <clears throat> Robin, first, it's wonderful to see you personally, uh, but it's also great to be back with the Halifax uh, Forum. I have great affection for the organization. Been there, as you know, for a number of years. This is really a difficult time. You know, obviously, the uh, global pandemic uh, has uh, created uh, really substantial difficulties with respect to uh, foreign relations for many countries as they as they concentrated inward uh, to deal with the realities of their medical crises and almost invariably uh, an economic downturn it made international relations very difficult uh, that's just a symptom of the strategic environment in which we find ourselves right now um, but added to that was, I think, the, the wreckage uh, of this, this administration in the United States, <clears throat> a, uh, an administration that generally walked away from our multilateral organizations, uh, our commitment to multilateralism. Uh, it denigrated the usefulness of the UN. Uh, it walked away from UNRWA. And one of the things that I did in between uh, President Obama's uh, special envoy period and uh, my retirement from the military was to work on Middle East peace. You may remember that. I, I was very yeah. deeply involved in that. So we walked away from UNRWA, which disadvantaged the Palestinians, walked away from the World Health Organization. We walked away from the Paris Climate Accord. We, you know, the list is long. And then we didn't join things we should have joined, like the RCEP that was just signed uh, in East Asia, the, the regional uh, comprehensive economic uh, plan. Or, this or, is the one that 15 nations signed up to uh, on that, Sunday. That's exactly I think, right. Yeah. So because we became more bilateral and less inclined towards multilateralism, uh, because our relationships in the world tended to be more economically transactional than to have a, a higher uh, moral policy dimension to them, what we would call a transformational relationship as opposed to a transactional. I think the, uh, the state of the world, the global community, rules-based community that we grew up with, you and I, uh, during the Cold War and in a period afterwards has really taken a terrible beating because of the difficulties of the disease and the economic challenges, but also because the, uh, the U.S. really walked away from many of its traditional leadership roles in the world. Um, and so, you know, we have, I think, 62 days left in this administration, and, and I won't purport to speak for the Biden administration, but I know him. Uh, well, and I know many of, uh, we, we have an embarrassment of riches with respect to the human talent around him. Uh, and I know that first and foremost, uh, if you listen closely to his inaugural address, the people of the world will have a very good feel for what he, he and his administration, along with Kamala Harris, will stand for in the world. It's, I think first and foremost, you hear our recommitment to human rights. That's the first thing, a, a recommitment to the principles of democracy, for God's sake, at least in the United States, certainly, given the problems that we have just were experiencing every single day in the aftermath of our presidential election. But more broadly, a celebration of uh, what, where we need to go, which is, I think, uh, more broadly define the community of nations along democratic terms. Uh, and look, the democracies of East Asia are some of the most functional in the world, yet we continue to use this term, the West, in, in almost an exclusionary way. And as has been recently demonstrated through uh, uh, the comprehensive, uh, progressive, uh, trans-Pacific uh, trans partnership and RCEP, there are uh, fora where democracies and proto-democracies are trying to come together to find their way in the future. And without the United States in a leadership position, that's that's very difficult. So to your point, Robin, re-emphasis on uh, human rights, 
re-emphasis on multilateralism, a, a very strong emphasis on bringing together the communities, a community of democracies. The Biden administration is going to call it a summit of democracies where we deal with these issues of trade, where we deal with these issues of human rights, where we deal with these issues of strengthening democratic principles. And very importantly, we deal with these issues associated with technology, because in many ways, and we're seeing it every single day, technology is going to define much of the geopolitics of the 21st century. And in fact, it is one of the principal mm -hmm. definitional differences that we find right now between the United States and China. Uh, and and so, I, on that very subject of, um, of um, technology, I, you, you published a book this year, Turning Point, Policy Making in the Era of Art Artificial uh, Intelligence. <clears throat> and so, so this is something, and I know that uh, following uh, the material that comes out of Brookings, this is something that you've really driven very hard. Um, where do you see the international architecture, the global governance architecture developing when we look at technology in general, artificial intelligence in particular. And again, focusing on this question of, of how do democracies, how do we get our way when there are non-democracies, a very powerful one called so the People's Republic of China, that don't sure. want us to get our way? How do we actually do that? We've got to start to think in terms of a community. Uh, and think about the, the democracies that we're talking about. The transatlantic relationship is one that, while it has taken a beating in this administration, and you even heard the president of the United States call the EU America's number one foe in one moment of unhinged uh, ex uh, extemporaneous talking. Um, we, we have got to understand that China is too big for any one of us any longer to compete against. And this is a matter of really strategic competition. Uh, and so our, our future and our interests are best served if we're able to come together. Now, the, the challenge, uh, Robin, and you'll understand this immediately, it took many, many years for uh, us to build the kinds of regimes on uh, <clears throat> the limitation of behaviors on with respect to certain weapon systems or certain capabilities. And we have yet, I think, in a comprehensive way, in the way we must come together as a community of democracies to talk about how we will protect the interests of our citizens from predatory behaviors uh, that are uh, platformed and abetted uh, by higher technologies, more sophisticated technologies. Mm. Um, you know, in China, there it's the greatest surveillance state on the planet and, and uses highly sophisticated uh, artificial intelligence uh, algorithms supported by very sophisticated computing capabilities to keep very close track on its citizens. You, sh you would not be surprised that when the Chinese uh, deal overseas with uh, development partners, that some part of that development relationship is the export exporting of that kind of technology, which reinforces illiberalism or even authoritarianism in some, uh, some of the developing countries in the world. We've, we have got to come together as a community of democracies, and, and frankly, this recent uh, Halifax Forum uh, book on China, uh, I was very pleased to see that it puts a lot of emphasis on democracies coming together and have, and this is the key to your point, we've got to start to have the conversation about how we aggregate our technological capabilities and do it in a manner that is consistent with our commitment to human rights, to privacy and to doing good for all humankind, to include, by the way, the humankind inside China. Because if we are able to do that, we in fact can affect uh, the Chinese in a very positive way as well. So, um, you know, I just think that uh, the opportunity for us in the aftermath of four years of, of American absence for the Biden administration to exert the global leadership that we have typically uh, exerted, uh, and I think the thirst among the democracies to want to see some form of a coherent uh, community dialogue on these matters, whether it's about dealing with COVID or dealing with development in the developing world, dealing with climate change, uh, dealing with issues associated with emerging technologies. I think there's a real thirst for that. And here is the role that the United States can play, I think, in a very important leadership and partnership role in the world. Um, and, and thank you for mentioning the handbook for democracies we just put out. I authored it and I spoke to, I mean, we as a, as a group spoke to about 250 people um, around the world. And, and actually one part of it, and I was speaking uh, also, I've already spoken to uh, Ai Weiwei, the, uh, the, the famous Chinese uh, artist and dissident. And, 
You know, one of the questions that, of course, we deal in, 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 in conversation about high politics, about the President of the United States, about the leaders of countries and organizations, there's also a responsibility, is there not, to ordinary people, to everybody in society, when we're confronted with an authoritarian state. I mean, you know, uh, we have this, uh, at the back of the book, you'll see these HFX China principles, where we're trying to bring it down also to the human level, where, uh, you know, at least don't exceed uh, to censorship. Um, if you know that goods are being produced using forced labor, don't buy them. Um, those kind of principles, I mean, how important is it uh, beyond the level of government, beyond the level of major international institutions, uh, to engage with ordinary people, uh, to discuss these matters, and to also say, hey, if you live in a democracy, you also have a responsibility yourself. Well, I think that's uh, that's inherent. Uh, you know, if you look at the U.S. polling on how Americans might feel about international relations, Americans are are very uh, interested in uh, a an important role for the United States uh, uh, externally in the international community. They are a bit more skeptical, uh, or they need a bit more convincing when we start getting very serious about a particular aspect of that relationship or that presence or a particular country. Now, one of the difficulties that we've had uh, is that uh, this administration has uh, taken the U.S.-China relationship, and the Chinese deserve a lot of credit for this as well, in a very negative direction. Uh, and I think the accumulation of power in the person of Xi Jinping uh, has created an individual of power in the Chinese uh firmament of leadership that we've not seen since Mao Zedong. And, it, you know, his words are being now embedded in the Chinese constitution. Uh, and he has been called euphemistically the chairman of everything. Uh, so sometimes it might be difficult to, to burn through that appearance of a monolithic leadership at the top of, of China. But I think that we would find if we spent some time thinking about it and talking to folks, and you have clearly just mentioned talking to a dissident, that we share an awful lot with the Chinese people with respect to values. Um, now, as, com as a community of democracies, which again, the handbook, I think, uh, emphasizes well, we have a responsibility in our relationship with the Chinese or other authoritarian states or uh, slippery illiberal states, and we're seeing some of them, some in Europe, um, perhaps I'm living in one, I'm not sure at this point, um, where where the individual has to also appreciate that one of the going in dimensions of what we uh, need to have be paramount in our conversation is a commitment to human rights. And we have to do that. Uh, this is what I think you'll see in the new Biden administration, what I would consider to be a values based value, a values based emphasis on transformational diplomacy. And I think that's, that's not inconsistent with who we are as Americans. It's not inconsistent with who we are as a country. Um, but on issues with respect to China of the Uyghurs, you know, a million people are in detention centers and being re-educated. The wiring is being uh, restoked inside their minds to think differently. Uh, issues associated with uh, Hong Kong and their commitments to that, that small democratic uh, enclave on, on the the uh, edge of the Chinese, uh, the great Chinese communist empire. Uh, those commitments are being massively violated and, and we need to hold China accountable for that. Um, and then we need to be unambiguous in our support for Taiwan and the Taiwan people. That's a vibrant democracy in ways many democracies are, are could be or should be envied, frankly, in what we euphemistically call the West. Uh, and it's a democracy that deserves our support. And even though the U.S. has, has committed to a one-China policy, our policy is very clear. While we don't support Taiwan independence, we will actively oppose any effort by force to change the status quo. So we have to support uh, the Taiwan democracy and the Taiwan people. We've got to take action for, to provide for the freedom of commerce through the South China Sea and be prepared to take assertive action if necessary. And then we have friends along the fence line, if you will, of China, like India. India is a very functioning, very vibrant democracy. And while it has many challenges at the social level, uh, it, in fact, is bumping up against the Chinese and quite, quite uh, worrisome military aggressiveness. And we should be supporting our Indian friends, which is a, a democracy that should play in the larger conversation about democracies. So to the handbook, I think you've got it right uh, in the context of uh, 
emphasizing democracy and and inherent in democracy is a commitment to human rights, a commitment to democratic principles and processes and a system of government and a commitment to uh, free and open uh, economies. And uh, now, Robin, as you know, uh, the devil is in the details. And so going from uh, a whole series of principles that are uh, importantly stated, but will be uh, ultimately a responsibility for implementation, that's where the challenge will come. And we'll see how, when implementation occurs, if we've been able to remain true to our principles. Somehow that some that gets stripped away, as you know, from time to time. Absolutely, I, I'm glad you mentioned India there because one of the um, uh, in the concluding part of the Handbook for Democracies, uh, you'll see there's uh, there's a mention of the Quad, which I'll come to in just a second. And right. uh, you know, one the most well-meaning people in the world um, <clears throat> look at NATO, and I've spoken to people who say, yes, what we need is a global NATO. And I remember in the course of the research for, for this project, uh, speaking to people all over Asia, but most particularly, I remember one conversation with a, uh, a senior Indian. And I, and I just put it, not, not, because I think it, not because I thought initially it was the right thing to do, but, but you know, what about the idea of a global NATO? And every time I raised that point in Asia, all I got was a sort of blank stare. <laughs> I mean, even very friendly conversations, and there's just no appetite for that kind of thing. And I think this then speaks to the idea of reimagining alliances among democracies in the 21st century. Why is global NATO a non-starter? Well, do countries that only became free from colonial powers in the middle of the last century really want to become party to to organizations which are dominated also by the old imperial powers, even if it's under new management by the United States. There's no appetite for that. But interestingly, something like the, the Quad, uh, the Quadrilateral Security uh, Dialogue, uh, made up of the United States, <coughs> India, Japan, and Australia, of course, which really sort of achieved a renaissance in 2017. It's, it's a, it started off uh, way back in 2004, really, with the cooperation amongst the navies uh, owing to the uh, 2004 uh, tsunami. Uh, it it kind of died a death after being started in 2007, in, in 2008, and now it's come back. And there's a lot of enthusiasm for this style of, of much more informal partnership, flexibility, don't expect every country within it to do exactly the same thing. You know, uh, Japan may not provide as much military heft as India, and India won't provide, of course, as much military heft as the United States. Australia perhaps brings in the five eyes. There are lots of ways to configure democratic partnerships in the 21st century. While NATO is a wonderful thing, and, and I say should stay right where it is and keep doing the great job it's doing, is that there are lots of ways to, to think about democratic alliances in the 21st century. And I wonder what you think about that. What, how do we rethink and reimagine uh, alliances between democracies in this century? Now, let me ask for a clarification. When you say alliances, do you mean defense alliances or the, the relationships between democracies more broadly? I, I, I'm, I'm, I mean, I, I do actually mean more specifically defense, strategic alliances, strategic defense alliances. I mean, the Quad does all sorts of things, but I mean, it is also a military partnership. I think they might reject the term uh, alliance, but certainly a partnership. Yes, they would. Look, um, there has been a term that you'll hear in the Trump administration, which I don't disagree with, uh, which is a free and open Indo-Pacific. And for many, many years, as you'll remember, we had our uh, military command, the Pacific Command, uh, headquartered in Hawaii. Uh, its Western uh, boundary of interest was the Western border of India. And the Eastern boundary of interest of the U.S. Central Command was the Eastern border of Pakistan. Um, now, uh, under this administration, I think we properly uh, returned uh, that command to the Indo-Pacific Command to, to put the kind of emphasis we need to. Uh, if you talk to Australians for any length of time, pretty quickly, they'll raise the issue that uh, more American interest in the Indian Ocean and more American interest in strong relationships, whether it be security or otherwise, with India is good for the entire region. Uh, and so acknowledging that, I think that the, uh, the Quad, there is a security logic to the Quad. Uh, but I think that there's also uh, some irony that uh, in this new 
uh, regional uh, or comprehensive progressive Trans-Pacific trans Partnership or the regional comprehensive economic partnership, India and the United States are not in it. Um, and so I, I see the logic of a quad, uh, but I also would see the logic of the quad, I, I see a weakness of the quad being defined solely in security terms. There is way too much uh, potential value to those four great democracies, Japan, Australia, the United States, and India. There's way too much uh, potential energy that could be gathered uh, by having an economic relationship, by committing itself to development strategies. Uh, and I'm, you know, I'm way outside my uh, remit right now, my portfolio. But I always worry in an environment, especially in East Asia, which is organizing in very decisive ways around economic relationships, which could have been quite beneficial to us in some respects, and certainly to the Indians. But we're, you know, you have U.S. on one side and you got India on the other side, and neither of them are in the most comprehensive economic relationships that we've had. Yet we have four partners in the Quad who have undeniab undeniably sound security interests in the region, may find themselves in a in a crisis coming together over matters of security. But it's not an alliance, as you said. The 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 participants are not obligated to come to the defense of someone else. So in a uh, crisis like the tsunami, and I, I was involved in the tsunami, and I saw all of those partners arrive uh, in a very real way to provide support. The Australians were there immediately, magnificently. The Indians did their business in, uh, uh, in the Indian Ocean, and the Japanese showed up very quickly. Uh, so there, there is real logic to that. But I hope that the logic of the Quad doesn't end in a loose security relationship when the whole rest of the region is in fact organizing at an economic level. And as you know, when you have economic relations, other things can follow that can be quite beneficial. Um, I would hope that we could think more broadly about what the Quad is. And you know, with regard to a global NATO, I'm not so sure we don't, in some respects, have one in some, in some respects. Look, we, we have uh, partners, NATO partners, and some NATO members who are routinely um, doing freedom of navigation uh, operations in the South China Sea to make it very clear to the Chinese that while whatever they say with respect to their sovereignty over those waters, we don't recognize it. And it's it's about the freedom of economic enterprise and the freedom of commerce in that region that the United States will never recognize that. Now, the question then becomes, and it's a very difficult question, quite a delicate question in uh, Brussels, and that is if the United States in some form or another found itself in many respects, the, the Chinese maritime militia is, is a quite undisciplined and quite worrisome entity in the South China Sea. And they've surrounded our ships before, and I, I think um, uh, we came quite close to defending ourselves. If we ended up in some kind of a shooting uh, match in the South China Sea, which no one would want to have happen, and it begins to spin uh, into an escalatory uh, appearance, is that a Article 5 issue with regard to NATO as a NATO partner? Uh, looking out for the freedom of commerce of, of the free trade of which Europe enjoys a great deal of benefit and access in East Asia. So uh, these are ways we have to think about the new future and uh, of the 21st century. But to your point and to the handbook, emphasis on democracy, emphasis on human rights, emphasis on the democracies having this large global conversation about what we stand for, what the future will bring us and how we'll take a position on that, I think is a very, very powerful and useful contribution. General Allen, it's always a pleasure and an education to talk to you, but I have one final question. Uh, sure. And uh, it, it's bouncing off uh, a couple of remarks you made, which uh, uh, you, you sounded as though you know quite a lot about what's going to be in Joe Biden's inauguration speech and, and the, the thinking of the new team. Uh, are you uh, thinking, uh, have, you, have you had conversations with uh, President-elect Biden recently? And of course, I'm driving towards the question, will you uh, be, uh, be working for uh, Mr. Biden uh, at some point in the future? Well, Robin, we'll all be working for Mr. Biden in some way or another, uh, and that's, that's all I'll say. I have uh, I have no uh, no indications. I'll just leave it at that. That I am going into the administration. I'm very happy at the Brookings Institution, uh, one of the happy partners of the Halifax Forum, and 
and I will stay there, I think, uh, for some period of time. Wonderful. Well, whichever role you take, it's always uh, uh, it's always uh, obvious that uh, the United States uh, is blessed to have you, and we are too. And thank you for joining us. Uh, and I wish the forum great success this year. I'm sorry we can't all do it together and and decrease the population of lobsters, but. Uh, uh, next that, time. That's exactly right. I mean, I was thinking also about fishing, all this kind of thing. I mean, next year, there's going to be a bountiful year for everybody, isn't there? It shall be. It shall be. All right, Robin. God bless you. Take Same care. Same to you. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.